So thanks again for giving me a chance to present uh, about, uh, let's say, treatment optimization in colorectal cancer. And, you know, I tried to synthesize some of the ideas that I had before ASCO 2013, some of the ideas that came after ASCO 2013, in particular with regard to you know, the usefulness of cetuximab or bevacizumab in first-line therapy. So right now what we're facing as oncologists is we have a, quite a number of agents available in the treatment of colorectal cancer, chemotherapy and antibodies, and most recent additions of flibercept and regorafenib. And in order to simplify our approaches, of course, we use guidelines. You can see how simple the guidelines have actually integrated these, uh, these uh, uh, different treatment approaches. Um, but all these guidelines actually make sense because we're moving patients from line to line of therapy. And every line that follows another line is based on its decision on what patients received previously. So the landscape of metastatic correct cancer before ASCA 2013 for me was Bevacizumab and EGF-receptor antibodies were competing for first-line patients with, meta, uh, with metastatic colorectal cancer, KRS wild type. Bevacizumab and the Flibacep were competing for second-line patients with each other and with EGF-receptor antibodies in second-line KRS wild type colorectal cancer. Best sequence of therapy, what to use first, uh, has to be established. And you know that we, at least in first-line therapy, in combination with chemotherapy, should not combine each of septa antibodies and bevacizumab. And regorafenib stood alone as a therapy option. So for my talk, the question that I try to answer is, how can biologics be used to their full potential, which has implications for duration of therapy? And I'll highlight the importance of duration of VEGF inhibition, for instance. Predictive markers, you heard very elegant pre presentations today from panitumab-based studies. The panitumab-based studies really lead the way in our understanding of RAS signaling pathways and have huge implications for our clinical practice. And then, of course, can a patient population, a specific patient population, be identified that, uh, that benefits from one specific treatment strategy? So let me walk through these different classes of agents that we have available right now and start with anti-VEGF agents. And the point I want to make right early on is duration of anti-VEGF therapy matters. And we know this from the analysis of a trial, for instance, the infamous 966 trial, Zelox, Falfox, plus minus bevacizumab, the outcome data for the overall patient population in terms of PFS, and Dirk Arnold presented the data earlier today, were not that convincing. But for those patients who continued bevacizumab and fluoroprimidines until progression, the outcomes were actually quite substantially positive with hazard ratios in the range of 0.65. So this was one of the first studies where we showed it's important to continue treatment until progression and do not stop too early. So when we look at all the comparative studies, including FHIR-3 and 8405, one of the criticisms, one of the important points is to analyze was, were arms really continued until progression or did patients stop treatment too early? You saw in the FHIR-3 analysis today, and I agree the presentation was excellent and gave us a lot of insight about, you know, the questions we had after ASCO, that the duration of treatment was not necessarily optimal, in particular not in the, um, in when we compare duration of therapy compared to progression-free survival. Now, I also like to highlight the clinical synergisms we see with fluoroprimidins and bevacizumab. The AVEX data, very strong data, highlight capsidabin with bevacizumab, very strong results. Elderly patient population, a median progression free survival of 9.1 months. That is actually very strong and reminiscent of the data we saw with the IFL plus minus bevacizumab data, the strongest overall survival data we've seen so far. Cairo 3 which I think is one of the most underappreciated studies presented at ASCO, second only to the, uh, the panitumab analysis of the RAS mutation. Cairo 3 really, in my perspective, highlighted again that maintenance therapy with uh, fluoroprimidine plus bevacizumab can improve outcomes for patients. The study was positive for every single endpoint except for overall survival, um, and it's not easy to develop the right endpoints for strategy trials. But when you look at the difference here, primary endpoint clearly met, statistically significant. And when you look at the PFS from start of therapy, meaning induction chemotherapy, and then maintenance therapy and reintroduction of oxaplatin-based therapy, which is what we do in clinical practice, playing with an oxaplatin-based regimen. If you sum this all up, which we consider still first-line therapy, we have a first-line PFS of 15.5 months. We should not underappreciate that. 
Delta overall survival here, 3.5 months. Not all overall survivals are statistically significant because p-values are sample size driven. If you want to make the smallest difference in, p in, in, in outcome statistically significant, you blow up your sample size. Sample size drives the p-value, and I think this is always something we have to keep in mind. 3.5 months difference in overall survival. I think this is a, a strong message for the use of maintenance therapy with a fluoropermid and bevacizumab. <clears throat> Duration of anti-VEGF therapy again highlighted in the TML study, which you already saw uh, presented again today by, uh, by Dick Arnold. I don't want to go into detail. We have overall survival benefit and 19% reduction of death events on the study. Um, confirmatory PFS benefit here with a hazard ratio of 0.68, pretty strong. And again, highlighting duration of anti-VEGF therapy can improve outcome for patients. This is again, um, supported by additional data coming from other large molecule VEGF inhibitors, in particular, a flibacep, or you know, know ramucirumab is currently being tested in a similar second line setting. Now, a flibacep is another molecule we have to discuss, Velour, a second line study um, after oxaplatin based first line therapy, 30% of patients had prior bevacizumab, and a flibacep was added to Fulfiri in a randomized comparison, 1,200 patients, and endpoints, overall survival and progression free survival, very similar in their outcomes to the uh, uh, TML bevacizumab beyond progression study. And even in those patients who had prior bevacizumab in the Velour study, they benefited to the same extent in terms of their time-related parameters, overall survival and progression-free survival. <clears throat> Again, supporting the idea of continued VEGF inhibition beyond progression, duration of VEGF inhibition matters. Now, one interesting point that I try to make here, which leads into some discussion later, is that the response rate achieved in second-line therapy with Fulfiri plus uh, Flibacept depended on whether or not patients had prior bevacizumab in first-line therapy. And interestingly, those patients who had had bevacizumab in first-line therapy experienced a lower response rate in second-line therapy. Of course, this is an exploratory analysis, unplanned, but it might show us that first-line therapy might change the, let's say, biology of a disease or responsiveness of disease to second-line therapy. There's something we should not ignore. We're changing tumors from line to line of therapy with every intervention that we inflict on them. The problem with the flibacept, and this is one of the reasons why it has not been widely adopted in the, at least the American academic centers, is the toxicity profile, which was surprisingly um, yeah, chemotherapy reminiscent with uh, diarrhea, neutropenia, asthenia, stomatitis, etc., and a lot more patient discontinued flibacept in this placebo control trial due to AEs than placebo. So, conclusion for anti VEGF therapy where how do we place them and what do we do? Duration of anti VEGF therapy matters, treatment to progression, maintenance strategies, and treatment beyond progression have all been validated. They, we have data, phase three data on them. There's a clinical synergism between fluoropermidins and bevacizumab. And again, the AVEX data show again, if you really don't want to subject a patient to combination chemotherapy with reintegrin and oxaplatin, you can get away with capecidin, for instance, and bevacizumab. In my eyes, there's really not a clear positive distinguishing factor for the use of aflibacept versus bevacizumab in second-line therapy. You have some concerns about toxicity. We really need a head-to-head -head comparison to evaluate efficacy and toxicity in one patient population. And I want to just highlight something that came up earlier. Bevacizumab is combined with, with Falfox theory. The TRIPE data, very long overall survival, show how uh, relatively safe it is to combine bevacizumab with Falfox theory, which is probably not true true for the EGF receptor antibodies, and I want to get back to what Dirk Arnold said, you know, that you put some caveat on the combination of EGF receptor antibodies and uh, fall fox theory. Now, turning to EGF receptor monoclonal antibodies, which is a more complicated field to talk about, but we have gained a lot of understanding about the mechanisms of drug resistance here and what we're really influencing with an antibody uh, that uh, binds at, uh, to a membrane-bound antigen on the surface of tumor cells. You know, when antibodies bind to these 
to the EGF receptor antibody, they prevent dimerization and potentially shut down the downstream signaling cascades. We know if RAS is activated, now we'll talk about all RAS, of course, not just KRAS. Whatever happens upstream doesn't matter anymore. But beyond RAS, there are more factors like RAF alterations, PF3 kinase, P10 expression levels, and ligand expression levels, and we'll come back to that. We know that EGF septa antibodies work very well in a salvage therapy setting, in wild type KRAS tumors with double progression free survival, with double overall survival, very strong hazard ratio for cetuximab and panitumumab, a single agent in this refractory salvage therapy patient setting. Now, moving it earlier in the line of therapy, the CRISPR trial is probably the most prominent study conducted in this setting, full theory plus minus cetuximab. This, these are actually the initial data presented by Eric van Kutzem. When we didn't know about uh, KRAS, the KRAS story, we saw you see these curves dance around each other, and they separate at about 50, 45, 50 percent of patients. Whenever you see anything like this, this, of course, indicates a subgroup effect of a group that has no benefit. We know now that part of this is KRAS mutation, and if you just look at KRAS wild type exon, two patients, and separate these out where you find the patient population. The curves separate earlier, but it seems to be there's still a subgroup effect of about 20% of patients. And this is where the later analysis, which we heard today, comes in. But hazard ratio and p-value are much stronger now when you refine the patient population. You've seen the data of prime looking at fault fox plus minus panitumab in first line setting. And you saw in this initial final analysis, and you take this final analysis with a little grain of salt because there was another final final analysis, you know, at ASCO, um, that patients with wild type KRAS tumors had benefit. Patients with mutant KRAS tumors had a detrimental effect. And I'm happy to see that with more events coming in now, the prime study is positive for overall survival, somehow debunking the idea that each receptor antibodies only work with arenotecan, because I don't believe that's the case if you conduct the right studies. Now, this is a slide I presented, routinely presented before ASCO, before the FHIR data, where I'd highlighted the kind of the evolution of hazard ratios from earlier lines of therapy to later lines of therapy, the, highlighting the idea that you get more bang for your buck, you have a stronger therapeutic effect when you use EGF receptor antibodies later in line of therapy as salvage therapy and not earlier or in adherent therapy where the two major trials have actually shown no or even a detrimental effect. Now, two things have changed, and I want to integrate them into my treatment algorithm, my, my perspective on how to use these biologics in colorectal cancer. Number one, very important, the updated analysis of the PRIME study. Probably most important data set presented ASCO that didn't make it to an oral presentation in the colorectal cancer session in many years. Because this is really practice changing, identification of another 17% of patients that should not receive panitumab and potentially cetuximab. And you've seen the data today. Not only can we refine patient population that benefits more, we also eliminate detrimental effect from those patients who get treated with the additional mutations with EGF certain antibodies. And I think this is very critical. In our treatment, in my practice, I have inflicted a detrimental effect on patients because I didn't know about these data. And I would like to be able to change my clinical practice right away when I come home uh, uh, to, to Rochester. Um, but we don't have the tests available yet. And it might take a long time, at least in the United States, to really get this into integrate into label. Europe is much more advanced in this setting. But the idea that, let's say, let's say all wild-type tumors do better than some mutated tumors, or only one, wild, one aspect of wild-type tumors, is not new. In 2009, there's a, a publication from Salvatore Siena's group, outcome of each receptor antibody therapy in a non-randomized uh, analysis for patients based on KRAS, BRAF, pic 3 cn P10 mutation and alteration levels. So you can see that the, let's say, fewer mutations or alterations patients had, the better the outcome was. So this is nothing new. It's just something that we anticipated over time. We just lacked the tools and actually the analysis of a prospectively conducted clinical trial to validate what we thought. 
Now, FIRE 3 comes into play, of course, and this is very important. You've seen the design of the trial, cetuximab versus bevacizumab compared to, uh, added to Folfiri. Primary endpoint was not met. It was actually a surprise to me because I did believe that cetuximab in this setting would beat a bevacizumab in an ITT analysis. How valid the accessible patient analysis is remains to be seen, but I uh, think this is actually interesting to see that, about, that both um, uh, regimens have a response rate of about 60%. No difference in progression-free survival. Actually, progression-free survival is very much the same that we saw in crystal. Crystal progression-free survival of Fulfurious Fetuxima was 9.9 .9 months. Here it's 10 months, so there is very strong consistency between these studies. The overall survival, of course, threw us all off, and I don't want to replicate um, uh, Alberto Sobrero's discussion. This is not what I stand for, but I do highlight that, of course, it's interesting to see that the progression-free survival benefit um, and no difference in progression-free survival. Separation comes later. And we do have to explain this because we are talking about who should receive which biologic in which line of therapy. So from my, potential, my personal view, potential reasons for the overall survival difference with the same progression-free survival can only happen because of either imbalance of post-progression therapy, which we saw very nicely presented today, that it's not the case in FIRE, or the first-line therapy affects sensitivity of cancer cells to subsequent lines of therapy. And you've seen some data already in the Velour study, first-line therapy can affect the outcomes in second-line therapy. There's a hint, and we have not appreciated these conditions nicely. We don't have experimental models developed to really investigate these things. So this could be a clonal, an early clonal selection, and leads to the question, is there an optimal sequence of treatment options here? And, but I do believe one of the most intriguing data, one of the most intriguing thoughts that I think kind of could explain what happened in FIRE 3 is that first-line therapy is highly effective in a certain subpopulation of patients with long-lasting treatment benefit. Keeping in mind at the time when these curves separate and where this error actually points to, there are 60 patients and 47 patients still on study, which means about 25% of the patient population that initially started uh, in the randomization. So who are these patients who have the benefit? And I would encourage the FIRE 3 investigators to look for all RAS, pic 3 ca BRAF, P10, EGF septal ligands. It could very well be that this is a clonal selection, a subgroup, molecularly defined subgroup could benefit with long-term survival. And those might be exactly those patients who should receive EGF septal antibodies in first-line therapy. So my conclusions for the EGF septal antibodies is the efficacy in KRAS wild-type colorectal cancer and our RAS wild-type colorectal cancer is well established. I personally strongly believe, and we can get into a long discussion about this, that cetuximab and panitumab are likely interchangeable. Further molecular refinement of this patient population considered a candidate for EGF septal antibody beyond codon 12 and 13 of KRAS is essential to avoid a detrimental effect of therapy and to enrich the patient population where you have a better benefit side effect margin, you improve the therapeutic index. And more data will come, as Alan already showed from the, uh, demonstrate from the head-to-head -head comparison, uh, cetuximab versus bevacizumab uh, from 84.05. And I do believe that 84.05 should also take lessons from prime and from FIRE 3, how to best analyze and characterize the patient population that can benefit from EGF septa antibodies. So all, wild, all RAS wild-type colorectal cancer make up about 40 to 45 percent of patients with colorectal cancer. I, can, I would predict, and from the analysis we've seen so far, there will be further molecular refinements to this group, uh, including P10 expression levels, EGF septal ligand expression levels, PIC3 analysis, um, BRAF analysis, which could identify patient populations suitable for EGF septal uh, antibodies, which might actually only be about 30 to 35 percent, but those patients should receive EGF septal antibodies in first line because they might actually have a marked benefit. So in the end, and I like to use this analogy of a subgroup, a smaller subgroup, that EGF septal antibodies could eventually turn into the trastuzumab of metastatic colorectal cancer after all, something we've been looking for. Now, not coming from a positive uh, predictive marker, but from a refinement of negative predictive marker and exclusion of patient populations. Regorafenib is pretty easy to place. 
It's, it's a multi-kinase inhibitor um, which has activity in the salvage therapy setting. Very quickly, the CREC study design looked at patients that had received all lines of therapy, PS0 to 1, life expectancy of at least three months, and we saw the survival benefit um, which, uh, in the study which I co-chaired with Eric van Kutzem, hazard ratio 0.77. The PFS curve was interesting because there was this convergence of this curve initially and then separation later. And I want to highlight, you know, not, sometimes it's not just a biomarker which can generate curves like this, but also that some patient in the salvage therapy setting might have be, been beyond the point of return that no treatment would have been able to pull them back and make them uh, kind of survive longer and have no tumor progression. So these could be patients beyond the point of return and not necessarily a biomarker in phenomenon. So to summarize and conclude, um, we know biologics play an important role in the treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer. We need them to optimize outcome. The identification of patient population that benefit from a very specific treatment sequence of treatment intervention is emerging, and I do believe that the all RAS wild type plus other factors can really lead us to believe that there is a subgroup of patients that should receive EGF subtype antibodies up front. At this point, however, and until 84 or 5 results are available, and with the caveats that Alberto Sobrero pointed out, that we really don't know exactly, is this just, is this real, what we saw? Because it's not clearly consistent with everything we've believed. Bevacizumab first line is an appropriate treatment options, option for a patient with metastatic colorectal cancer with KRS and wild type tumors. And duration of therapy and access to all treatment options is essential. Still, even in the Cairo 3 and in FIRE, only a minority of patients, and this is not what we like to see, a minority of patients will have access to all treatment options. And we need this access to all treatment options because we want to improve survival. And this is correlated with making drugs available, all active agents available to our patients. So we have made advances, and Alan already pointed out that the median overall survival expected in 84 or 5 is similar to what we saw in TRIBE, 30, hopefully 30 plus months. These are major advances we've made by adding incremental steps over the last years on top of each other. We should not be ashamed of adding 1.4 months and repeatedly on top of each other when we move overall survival within the last two or three years, actually, from a projected 24 months to now 30 plus months median overall survival in metastatic colorectal cancer. Thank you very much. <clears throat>